Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this year's Ipso Man Want Memorial Lecture. My name is Cheryl Lenorba and I'm the head of the Department of Asian Studies. Although today we have attendees dialing in from all over the world, in spirit we are gathered at UBC, which is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people and the Squamish and Tsleil Tooth peoples. This is, I believe, the 16th Ipso Man Wat Memorial Lecture, an annual series that features prominent scholars, writers, and thinkers on topics related to China. The Asian Studies Department would like to express our profound gratitude to Alex and Chisha Wat, whose donations to UBC have funded this lecture series in honor of their mother, as well as funding a scholarship in Chinese studies and support for our thriving Hong Kong initiative and Cantonese language program. Their generosity has made possible a whole host of classes, events, and research projects that have touched the lives of thousands of students, faculty members, and people in the community. So welcome. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Allison Bailey, who will introduce the speaker for this year's lecture. Thank you, Dr. Oba, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us today from everywhere. Um, I will first run through a few um, items regarding timing schedule, and then I will introduce our speaker, Professor Wai Yi Li. Um, we will have, uh, Professor Li will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session afterwards. If you have any questions, please submit them to the, into the Q&A box, uh, rather than the chat box and we will address them after uh, Professor Lee's presentation. Uh, please note that uh, this uh, uh, presentation, the lecture is being recorded um, and it will later be posted onto YouTube. Um, I also want to mention, and I'll, I'll remind people again at the end that uh, there is, uh, Professor Lee will also be giving a research seminar on Friday, January the 22nd at 12.30 to 2.30 Pacific Standard Time online via Zoom. Um, and you need to register separately for that. Um, I would like to uh, also uh, today, uh, following on from Dr. Orbao's uh, thanks to the uh, to Mr. Alex and Chi Sun Wat, I also would like to extend my gratitude to them for their very generous support of the If So Man Wat Memorial Lecture in honor of their mother. Um, I feel that Professor Li Wai Li very much embodies everything that this lecture series uh, represents. Uh, Dr. Lee is the 1879 Professor of Chinese Literature at Harvard University, where she has been teaching as professor since 2000. Um, she gained her BA from the University of Hong Kong and her PhD from Princeton. She is an extraordinary and inspiring scholar of Chinese literature and culture, and her work spans early Chinese thought and historical writing to late imperial Chinese literature and culture. Her publications include the perennially influential, at least on me, um, the enchantment and disenchantment in Chinese literature, which is something my students and I constantly uh, refer to. Um, the monumental women and national trauma in late imperial Chinese literature and other um, co-edited and edited volumes such as Trauma and Transcendence in Early Qing uh, Literature and the Oxford Handbook of Classical Chinese Literature, to name but a few. Uh, Dr. Li's scholarship is impeccable and her translations of poetry and prose, most recently seen in her very elegant Plum Shadows and Plank Bridge, are always finely wrought. Her forthcoming book, the Promise and Perils of Things in Literature and Material Culture in Late Imperial China forms the basis of her lecture today. Um, and now I will give you that title. Elegance and Vulgarity, The Promise and Peril of Things in Ming and Qing Literature. And I warmly welcome Professor Wai Yi Li. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alison. I, it's my great honor to be giving this um, Ipso Manwat lecture. And I 
also very much wants to thank the Watt family for making this possible and to Professor Bailey for inviting me and for, for her excessively kind introduction. So without further ado, I will just start. I will start with this, uh, the, the home of our ex-president, happily ex-president. And when we look at a picture like this, um, I don't know about you, but the first thing that comes to, to mind may be that it, it is really vulgar. At least, at, at least that's the way it appears to me. And the question is, why is this vulgar? Um, is this an aesthetic judgment or a moral judgment? Do, do we think that it is vulgar because there's too much gold, there's too much of everything, or because we already know that um, this is not a good person and so we, we judge accordingly? Or if we have to really put our finger on it, how exactly should we define what is vulgar? So start starting with this idea of a lot of stuff being vulgar or too much stuff, too excessively, um, too much excessively ornate stuff being vulgar. I want go to go to the opposite idea um, of not of disdain for things. So this is um, a, a well-known story from a fifth century collection, the new words from accounts of the era, Shishuo Xinyu, where uh, Wang Gong, um, in this story, Wang Gong just returned from Kuai Ji and then his kinsman Wang Chen visited him and asked to get his mat. And um, he, he's asking for it because he thought Wang Gong would have quite a number of this kind of bamboo mats. Um, what he did not know is that actually he has only one, but he he um, gives it up very easily because uh, he, he thinks of ownership itself as contingent and, and um, nothing that you need to be too worried about. So he, um, he comes up with this famous line, my way of being is such that I have no superfluous things. I mean, you, you can, as you can read from the anecdotes, right? So Zhang Wu, so this is also, it happens to be the, title of a very influential studies on, on, on material culture in, um, in um, late Ming China, which we'll get to later as well. So when, so more about Wang Gong in a, in a minute. Oops, why is this not working? Okay. So Wang Gong is um, famous for uh, many things. Uh, in in, in um, that fifth century book, he is described as a very elegant person, a very romantic person, pure and cleansed like a willow under a spring moon. He's also famous for this quip when, uh, where he said, said if, so long as you do nothing particular, not, so long as one does nothing in particular, drinks with abandon and reads encountering sorrow countless times, one can be called a gentleman, a gentleman of distinction. So what, what this so in other words, he comes across as the penultimate, perhaps as the ultimate elegant person, a person who is unburdened by things. Um, uh, but if you look more closely at that connection, collection, you will find that Wang Gong uh, was very active in Eastern Jin court politics. Both his father and grandfather were important um, statesmen. He was the a nephew and a brother to two empresses, and he was very much caught up in the power struggle at that time. So although in this story, he gave off the aura of someone who is very elegant, who is above worldly cares, who is unattached to material possessions. In fact, he is caught up in all these power struggles at that time. So one of the kind of um, uh, themes that will be running through today's talk will be how this, the, what, what looks like aesthetic judgment, what is it actually speaking to? What sort of ethical problems or economic issues or other things that it's speaking to when what on the surface looked like an aesthetic judgment, what may be behind it? Um, and of course, not only the, so as I said earlier, whether an aesthetic judgment is an moral judgment, to what extent do they overlap? Because after all, we are talking about what is, beautiful and ugly or what is good and bad, these two things don't necessarily overlap, right? They may sometimes even exist in contradiction. And then who has the authority to judge this? Uh, and to what extent is this related to social distinctions and power relations? So I want to start with the word for elegant in elegance in Chinese, the word ya and how it is linked to the idea of something normative uh, in both political and moral terms. So if we go to early texts like the Xunzi, 
um, from the third century, uh, we're told that that which is rooted in ritual propriety is correct or proper. Yeah, so yeah, or what we translate as elegant. Um, one of its root meanings is correct or proper. Um, so I, I give you some other examples of um, uh, uh, such usages as well in, in um, other early texts. And when we talk about a literary style as elegant, as for example here, Liu Xie in Wen Xin Diao Long in, the, in uh, what is translated as literary mind and carvings of dragons, when he tried to, tries, tries to define the, the style classical elegance, Dian Ya, uh, he, he describes it as a style that incorporates the model of canonical texts and proclamations and follows the tracks of Confucian teachings. So in other words, he's talking about a style that is not only controlled and um, balanced, but also uh, has uh, embodies within it some, some basic moral precepts. And you find this again and again. So I just quote actually somewhat randomly here is another example is Wang, Shi, Wang Shizhen from um, um, from the Ming Dynasty, uh, one, of, one of the well-known advocates of the classical style of returns to classical models. And he, use, he uses similar terms as well, that in other words, talking about elegance, but actually talking about a certain type of moral ideal. And here's ex another example also about defining the style of classical elegance, but um, in, a, in a different way. Here, elegance is more associated with distance, reticence, and indirectness. And um, the, the text is the 24 category, category, categories, categories of but at least according to some scholars, more probably um, um, created in the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, but here we're, we're not talking about moral correctness anymore. We're not talking about rectitude in that sense, but we're talking about, but we're still pursuing the idea of control and restraint. So we have all these images of quietude and um, um, distance and, and muted beauty. So I won't read the whole uh, verse because, you know, we can read it for yourself, right? such as these famous two lines, the falling, actually it should be, yeah, falling is fine. Fallen is also fine. Falling blossoms are wordless. And the person is, it, it, this dan, this muted is actually not perhaps the most accurate translation, but um, literally bland, but also, but bland is negative. And here it's, it's not supposed to be negative, but, but um, kind of, distant and restrained, like, like the chrysanthemums, lofty, like the chrysanthemums. So, so we're again, you know, as I said, pursuing the idea of restraint, but in a different context, in a more purely aesthetic context, perhaps, as compared to the moral one earlier. And here's Xu Guangqi. Xu Guangqi, uh, remembered in, in a lot of history books as, um, as uh, one of the Chinese scholar officials who converted to Catholicism, he was actually beatified by the Pope a few years ago. Um, but here he talks about elegant um, as, as something that has to be difficult, muted and restrained as opposed to anything that is essentially overpowering. Anything that is essentially overpowering or freewheeling is vulgar. So what he said in the last two lines is quite interesting. What is elegant must be bitter. What is vulgar must be sweet. So in other words, anything that appeal to your senses too directly or too overtly is vulgar by this definition. There's also another idea about elegance that is quite pervasive, that the idea that elegance has to do with exclusion. Um, I do not know Latin, but at least the dictionary said that the word elegance is connected to this Latin verb that means to select with care. And if you um, read the literature of connoisseurship, you, you come across this quite often about how in other words, a, des a description of how um, it's the select few that gets it. And if you extend uh, um, the connoisseurs to, to too big a crowd, then you are actually making the whole connoisseurship exercise meaningless. So here, Chen Ziru, a famous late Ming literatus, said, he wrote about tea appreciation. One person would get the spirits, the shen, two, the elan, the qu, three, the taste, the way, but for seven or eight persons, this can only be called offering tea like Buddhist arms. In other words, 
if you have a big crowd, then the, the elegance disappears. So who, who decides in, in all these cases, who are the taste police, especially when in, in the world that we are entering into in um, late 16th century, in the world of the late Ming, where, with all these commercial economic developments, with all these rich merchants um, uh, becoming quite powerful and uh, acquiring all the ornaments of literary culture. And, and taste changes so, changes so quickly in that world. So who, who um, has to say in this matter? So sometimes it's the literati themselves who appoint themselves as the fashion police. They like to talk about how Suzhou fashions and their followers, um, uh, 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 the, the, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Fashions change so quickly. And some, some um, um, objects produced by artisans can all of a sudden become really expensive and artisans can become like celebrities and uh, fans, ink, you name it, any, any objects that from just the, the, the from from just being an ordinary thing can become a much prized thing. They call this wu yao anomalous things. So if you read these accounts, you would think that maybe it is a question of the uh, um, literati identity, um, the, the the sense that they that they're conveying a sense that they're worried ab about the authority being usurped by artisans. But in fact, it's not quite like that because it's really the literati. Um, members of the literati who are turning names into brands. So they, they are the ones who declare that an artisan um, is, is not just an artisan, that he has a sensibility of, um, um, of a scholar, then, and that's what makes him famous. So, so in other words, although you, read, you can read between the lines literati and society, very often it is also a great opportunity for them as well. Um, so as I said earlier, the, the, there's a very well-known study of this subject by um, uh, Craig Clunas, Superfluous Things, and um, um, some of it um, um, derived from um, Pierre Bourdieu's um, uh, well-known study, Distinction, Social Critique of the Judgment of Taste. And um, uh, there's, there's a great deal of insights in that study, but um, um, as I will try to show, the the situation is actually quite complex and maybe not totally captured by the idea that um, the literati is really using um, connoisseurship as cultural capital as a kind of um, uh, countermeasure against the rising economic power of merchants, which is a, a narrative you see quite often. But in fact, um, there's some truth in that because you you you, you find um, literati writing with um, disparagingly about merchants quite often, but you also um, realize that they, 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 don't in, they don't only exist in competition, there's a kind of symbiosis between them. So this is a well-known anecdote, um, um, an exchange between Wang Shizhen and Zhan Xingfeng, um, both of them well-known as collectors and connoisseurs. And um, so Wang Shizhen um, declares that Quejo merchants, when they see Suzhou literati, they gather like flies over mutton. But John said that it's, it's the Suzhou literati who gather like flies over mutton when they see Xinan merchants. And Wang smiled and said nothing, meaning he accepts this judgment that, in other words, they have to, they depend on each other. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, I think, you know, so there is the, the literati versus merchants narratives. Uh, narrative is, is valid to a certain extent, but beyond that, there's also regional competition and personal rivalries, even among scholar officials and literati. And um, in other words, uh, one scholar official can criticize another for his failure of taste, and that has nothing to do with class anxiety or anything of the sort. And when it comes to who, de who defines the regime of taste, um, sometimes there's actually a great delight in crossing social boundaries. Um, in, in, there's one very famous story about appreciating tea in Zhang Dai's Taoan um, Mengyi, um, where he um, tells the story of himself um, savoring tea with a um, tea vendor and a courtesan. And, and then they, in some ways, they cross the social boundaries, right, about who is the literatus. But their, their new, um, um, this new group is in fact, um, uh, this new social, social gathering, so to speak, is, um, is, is the one giving 
um, tastefulness, a new a new definition. So to go back, but to to go back to what I said earlier about um, uh, Trump's house, which is so tasteless, um, there, there's a lot of people writing about that. So this is one 18th century scholar who said that wealth and position are close to vulgarity and poverty are, and lowliness are close to elegance. But those who enjoy wealth and honor while being vulgar are legion, but hard it is to find the poor and lowly who are also elegant. So that's really the kind of the conundrum of, um, of the of the matter because elegance depends on a material basis, but it always um, purports to disdain it. And so there is a kind of built in tension here, right? That uh, goes back to the Wang Gong story that we tell at the very beginning and we'll return to this later as well. In, in, in that world of, in, in the world that um, most of my examples from from here on will, uh, will will be about will be mostly 16th century, 17th century examples, and the two novels that I'll be talking about um, are um, Xin Ping and Hong Longhong, so the six, late 16th and 18th century writing. But um, um, uh, as I said earlier, this is a thriving um, e economic scene, and a lot of these elegant objects are also exchanged as commodity. And so this is one anecdote about how ancient paintings are priceless. So in, in this story, Wang Guxiang, he obtained four exquisite Shenzhou scrolls, and then a vulgar official from the Wu area offered to buy them with 200 tails of silver, but Wang refused. And later, when Wang Xiyuan caught, um, caught sight of them, he sat and slept by the scrolls for two days. And Wang Guxiang said that for the paintings to meet such a person is like having a real soulmate. So Zhen Jiziye. Um, so he told a story about the 200 tales. So when I first read this anecdote, when I came to this line that, th that this person is a real soulmate of the painter uh, of Shenzhou, I thought at first he's going to give those paintings to um, Wang Xiyuan, this new buyer, either for free or give it at a discount. But what I did not expect is that Wang Xiyuan then offered an estate worth a thousand tails in exchange for the scrolls. So in other words, there is um, a kind of unwillingness to talk about uh, money, but in fact, something of great value is being exchanged for these uh, scrolls. And you may be a real soulmate, but you still have to buy it with something that is worth a lot. Um, and I think this this um, kind of ambivalence about how to talk about money when when you also try to be elegant, you see that in um, uh, quite a lot of writings from the late Ming, from the from the sixteenth and seventeenth century. Sometimes um, you have elegant money talk. You have um, a, a deliberate way of also talking of, about money to show that you're not worried about talking money. So this, for example, is the the Yuhua. A contract on transporting spring water from the Pine Rain Studio. So what he's talking about here is a kind of arrangement of how they're going to transport water from a famous spring to where Liu Hua is living so that they can have the right kind of water for making tea. So this is, so in the discourse on tea, water features very prominently. We can talk more about that later too. So he starts this contract by talking about how, how wonderful the spirit is. Our spirit looks to the snow and bamboo because they're going to collect the snow and bamboo to make tea and our senses to the wind among pines. The, 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 the phrase the wind among pines is usually used to describe the sound of water boiling when you're making tea. So he has a lot of very elegant references for making tea. I'm not going to read all of it. But at the end of it, he talks about how since we live so near Huiquan, this famous spring for making tea, he's going to have um, an arrangement whereby this can be transported and um, each person is going to pay according to the size of the um, vessels they bring. And, um, um, and um, he goes into great particularity about pricing and how this is going to be done and so on. And, and he doesn't uh, at all of you that this is not elegant on the country on, on the country it is this unexpected combination of uh, of elevated talk about the pleasures of tea with some very practical arrangement that to most people would seem a little bit vulgar but precisely because he is bringing them together in this um nonchalant and and um uh witty way then he is the 
the new elegant person. So this is, uh, and so this introduces one of the strains in um, um, the discourse on elegance, which is how you have to define the usual norms for, for deciding what is elegant. So Wen Zhenheng in, in Superfluous Thing, for example, talk about how you have, you can't try always to avoid taboo. What people say is inelegant because if you do that, then you're straining to strike a pose of elegance. Or in another example by Wu Qijun in Records of Calligraphy and Painting, when he, he wants to look at a painting under lamplight, and supposedly this is what you absolutely should not do because the, the and in, in, in the connoisseurship literature, they repeat it again and again because the candle can, uh, the lamp, the, the, the oil from the lamp can, um, uh, can sully the painting. So you have to be very careful. But here, what he precisely, what he is precisely delighting in is that he is breaking the rule which takes us to the whole question of how self-conscious you should be about cultivating elegance. So for example, um, th there's this idea that cranes dancing to Scyther music is a, is a very elegant picture that when, when cranes um, um, spontaneously break into dance, listening to the music of Qin, of, of Scyther, then it's a very elegant thing. But Gao Lian in, in his, um, uh, eight, eight treatises uh, talking about all the pleasures of life. He actually tells you how to train the crane to dance. So if you wait till it's hungry and uh, leave food for it and have this lad clapping and swaying and basically luring it to dance, then if you program it in a, in a certain way, it will it will be it will be um, it will start dancing whenever it hears the music, so long as there's someone clapping next to it. Um, if the clapping is connected to the zither music, then it will start dancing. So in other words, he, he, the crane, he refers to it as a lofty friend oblivious to mundane cares, wang ji qing you. But the, the creation of the scenario for, for this delightful, elegant spectacle is very carefully managed and very self-consciously produced. And um, I, just to give you another example, he also talks about how um, when the uh, when the snow clears, you you should ride a donkey to go in search of plum blossoms. That is a very elegant thing to do. But then he also talks about what what should that spectacle look like. Um, uh, he asks, why do paintings on this subject always feature someone dressed in red? And and then he goes on to explain that this is just so that you can enter the painting, you can become part of the scene. You can create this interesting mood of soaring above the mundane, you know, ren chu su zhi qu. this is what you are striving for. So then he explains what he himself does, that in winter, he would always wear a red cape, a felt hat, ride a black donkey, followed by a lad carrying a wine flask. He would not do it in any other way because this is the way it should look. So in other words, you, in, in other words, it's about creating a spectacle of elegance as with featuring himself. So in the end, when he gets to the plum blossoms, he, he tells us this moment of forgetfulness. I no longer know that my body is a self among flowers and have also forgotten that flowers belong to the vision before my eyes. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of a very lofty moment, but again, uh, very self-consciously managed. And a lot of this is about looking, and this is a very famous episode, uh, maybe known to some of you, from Zhang Dai's dream memories of Tao An, when he says that Xihu um, uh, Ban on the seventh, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month at West Lake, there's nothing to look at but people looking at the moon. So, and then he gives you five categories of. Um, of how people look at the moon, for example, those looking at the moon in name, but actually do not see the moon, et cetera, et cetera. I won't read all of it. Um, but for each category, he, he ends with this uh, phrase, we look at them. So the people who do the looking are the ones um, who are superior. So in other words, in, in this connoisseurship literature, it's true that there is a kind of um, competition in places. And so in other words, who is competing to be the ultimate looker, who is standing at the outermost circle, who is looking at um, the other people looking, who is looking at how other people are uh, showing their 
powers of judgment, of aesthetic judgment, of connoisseurship. So it's true that there is Im implicit competition there, but um, again, to re reiterate a the point that I made earlier, it's very hard to draw um, group identity or class lines around that. It's, it's, um, it's a very fluid thing, but that, that the goal is to self-consciously define um, a, a group that is setting itself apart, that as such is true. Uh, I, I should not leave the subject of what is elegant and what is vulgar without also mentioning Li Yu in his casual expressions of idle feelings. Professor Patrick Hannon uses the phrase demotic elegance, uh, that how he's turning a lot of very common things into elegant things. And in fact, in casual expressions of idle feelings in, in that collection, it, it deliberately excludes a lot of um, what we usually consider as elegant things, such as paintings and calligraphy. Right? On the contrary, he talks about all the most mundane, even perhaps vaguely disgusting things, all the dirty and demeaning things. So long as it's done properly, it would afford uh, its pleasure. So even the, the, he talks about a certain fan-shaped window on a boat that uh, you can, um, if you look at it in a certain way, if the boat is going along a, a river, say, and you see the scene changing you see the scene outside changing all the time. It is the, 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 the window frame itself becomes like a picture frame. Um, so the way he describes it, he said that anything outside can become an elegant subject. So even the most rotten mushroom or, or herbs can become medicine. So a, 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 a lowly thing can become um, an elegant thing with the right perceiver and with the right framing. So you can say that this type of self-conscious elegance is almost a kind of um, pushback against the normative elegance that we begin with. In other words, um, it's, it's about the literati sense of uh, itself being able to define what is elegance and being able to redraw boundaries or very often um, define the arts and turning what seems vulgar into elegant. So, uh, I, I get to the main part of um, our talk today. I know I'm a little bit behind, so we'll see how far we go with this. Um, so uh, all this is really in, in some ways a kind of um, preamble to talking about these two novels, I hope known to some of you, um, uh, using the prism of elegance and versus vulgarity in, in rethinking uh, these well-known works and seeing what, what kind of... Um, perspectives that such um, such an inquiry would yield. Okay, so uh, Jinping Mei, let's begin with Jinping Mei. Um, as, as you know, this is a novel about this rich merchant and his six wives and his cronies and his dependents and his improbable rise to officialdom and great power and wealth and then his, uh, and then his eventual downfall. Um, uh, because of uh, sexual indulgence. And, um, and so this novel is really quite distinct, uh, perhaps because for the first time in, in Chinese fiction, you have a novel that is actually chock full of things. It's, it's endlessly talking about stuff. Uh, whenever a character is, is introduced, you, you have a very full description of what that character looks like. Anytime they have a meal, you have an enumeration of all the dishes. It is, is very, very interested in all these details of the materiality of that world, much more so, much more so even than Hongrenmu that we're going to talk about, much more so than anything before or after it, perhaps. And if we if we bring the lens of um, elegance versus vulgarity to think about the novel, it would seem actually pretty obvious, right, that this is um, a novel about vulgar people. And um, and there's everything in it is vulgar. There, there, there's, there's a lot of luxury goods. There's um, um, there are the people who wallow in it. And um, so, if all that if that is all we are seeing, that we actually that 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 is nothing new because that is perhaps the most obvious thing about that novel. Um, but. If we think about what, what then what is elegant in, in the novel, there's almost nothing that is elegant in the novel. What, what we see is 
a consistent vulgarization of elevated speech and cultural allusions. So just to give you an example, in chapter 49, Simon Ting is ordering entertains this official Tsai, who is the top candidate in the, in the palace examination. He's entertaining uh, this Tsai with singing girls. Um, and this is at, at chapter 49, and this is when Simon Singh is about to rise to the height of his power. So um, uh, this Tsai said to him, how can you, Sichuan, Sichuan is um, Simon Singh's courtesy name. How can you show me such generous regard? I'm afraid it will never do. And Simon Ting laughed and said, how is this any different from Se'an's roaming in the Eastern mountain? And Sen Tsai said, I only fear that my talent does not mesh up to Se'an while you, sir, do possess the lofty spirits of Wang Xichi. So what is behind the scene is that these two characters are comparing themselves to two Eastern Xi'an aristocrats, Se'an and um, Wang Xichi. So the most obvious thing one can say about this, of course, it, it is um, a most incongruous co comparison, uh, and and um, it just shows how how vulgar they are. Although they're comparing themselves to very elegant people, uh, Se'an is a um, famous statesman, um, but despite his political engagement, he is also known to take singing girls to go into to go travel in the mountain and so on. So. Whereas Wang Sichu, of course, is a famous calligrapher. But what, what actually um, concerns me here is not so much that they are not worthy of the comparison, but whether vulgarization itself, whether vulgarization tarnishes the symbolic power of all these epitomies of cultural refinement. So that's the question that um, is always at the back of my mind. Does it, in other words, does it also do something to all the standard formula of elegance? Not just that these people are not elegant, but does it do something to the very, very idea of elegance? So, for example, in the case of Xi'an, um, Xi'an, as this, as I said, as the famous statesman who also um, is is uh, indulging in sensual pleasures, is a figure that is constantly invoked, even by the most uh, famous literati, fam most famous writers, as as a kind of excuse for um, indulgence, because Xi'an, this fourth century person, is supposed to um, represent a kind of um, a kind of power to transcend that opposites, that that those opposites that you can be both politically responsible and also uh, visit quarters and quarters, for example. Um, so when 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 um, Jinping may brings up this comparison, is it also attacking that type of excuses or that type of reasoning? So that's what I'm interested in. Anyway, just to give you a few more examples of um, downward shift of emblems of elegance. So um, here, if you just look at, um, these are some of the chapter titles, Sweep, Snow and Bruce Tea. If you look that up, you will find that there are many poems about collecting snow and making tea with it. Um, a, a, a lovelorn woman playing the pipa on a snowy night, thinking about uh, her, her beloved. Um, you you will you find that a lot as well. Or um, looking at the snow in a kind of um, aesthetic contemplation in the study. That all these are standard tropes of elegance. But in the context of this novel, it it is all dragged in the mud. So, for example. Uh, when Pan Jinian plays the pipa on a snowy night, he is, what she is doing is trying to make as much noise as possible so that Simon Ting, so that her husband can, can, um, can be aware of her unhappiness uh, because he is in the room of her rival, Li Pinger. So she just wants to disrupt the, the, the amorous uh, night and to just... Um, register her discontent. So it's all very strident and very different from the um, uh, standard poetic image of the pining women. And likewise, Simon Ting uh, uh, looking at snow in that chapter does not say a word about him looking at the snow. It has to do with the whole parade <clears throat> of people going through his study uh, uh, dealing with the most mundane matters. And, and um, this is another example. And, and if you look at the whole novel, perhaps the most deliberately elegant decor is that of a courtesan 
Zheng Ayue, the moon whose name whose name means moon loving. And so here Ximen Ting is entering her parlor and looking at all the scrolls of beautiful women there. And then almost as a kind of a of a jolt, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, um, it, it it refers to Zheng Ayue as the fen tou, as the painted face, which is a kind of um, um, demeaning term for a courtesan. Um, you are told that this is just a, a courtesan who is selling sex for cash, but the the, the exotic aroma is as refined and elegant as could be. So again, the, the incongruity is very deliberate. So of all the can talk about things in the book, perhaps the, the, the one that is who has the most passages of describing things is this character Ying Bo Jue. So he is a psychophant who is um, administering to, to the needs of Ximen Ting and always flattering Ximen Ting. And he is the one through whose eyes we see this novel. And this is actually quite, um, uh, quite fascinating because he's a very vulgar person, but he also has the up, up, the powers of observation of a connoisseur. It's, it's true that what he looks at is very often not the substance of elegance, but the paraphernalia of it. So for example, here we have the first detailed description of Ximen Ting's study, but when Ying Bo Zhe look, looks at the landscape paintings, what he read, what he describes is the what is the mounting, mounted on ultramarine pattern damask with white satin border. And it's said to be landscape paintings by famous artists Ming Ren de Shan Shi, but we, we actually then know nothing about it. We only have the, 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 the mounting. Uh, and then inside those um, beautiful bookshelves, you have um, privately painted books with brocade wrappers and bolts of fabric. And on the, um, on the desk itself, uh, all these uh, festival gifts and lists of people with whom gifts have been exchanged. So in other words, you, you have a very detailed description, but you, you, you show the Ying Bo Zhe, the vulgar connoisseur, shows his real concern, which is the social, um, the, the material worth of all these things and the, and the social transactions um, that they embody. Um, but he, he does have all these very, as I said, because the flatterer, so he has to tell Ximen Ting how amazing uh, his possessions are. So that's why he um, gets all these stories about um, uh, interesting things uh, and unusual things. And sometimes it is as if he's displaying a kind of broad learning about things. We don't know whether this law is accurate or not. I think I'll skip this example in the interest of time. Um, but sometimes vulgarity is linked to a kind of almost virtuosic knowledge as for, as for example here, when a eunuch brings um, uh, cementing pots of chrysanthemums and then Ying Bo Zhe goes into great details about how these pots are made, that they are, they are made, in the, made of finest, finest clay in the imperial kerns and are both long lasting and water repellent, made, with, made from clay that has long been, that has been strained through silken sieves and kneaded underfoot until it becomes a thick paste, etc., etc. So Zhang Zhupo, the commentator, the um, uh, 17th century commentator, um, said that the emphasis is on the pots. This is how vulgar people of the marketplace love flowers. Granted, that's true. That's true. There's, maybe there's something vulgar in it. But in fact, all this uh, knowledge that he has about the flower pots, you, you actually find this sort of thing in connoisseurship literature as well. So in other words, although he's vulgar, this is a vulgar person and an immoral person, he gives you a lot of information that could have been taken from connoisseurship's handbook as well, especially this type of things. And there's also genuineness in vulgarity because uh, in Borja, because he's always hanging around cementing and eating and drinking and so on. Um, and, and always seeing how much he appreciates the taste of things. Here is his peon to a certain type of fish when he said that uh, even if this fish gets stuck in the cracks between your teeth when you manage to extricate, it's still fragrant. It's not easy to come by. And there's nothing elegant about it, but it is, and it's, is, but it's, it's also true. This is that, that despite his vulgarity, he is giving you a, 
a, a very um, truthful picture of the pleasure of the senses. Um, so to go back to the point I made earlier about this book not having any countervailing standards of elegance, I, I feel that this vulgar connoisseur, the idea of the vulgar connoisseur almost has a kind of subversive potential in the sense that vulgarity becomes the only value for appreciating the texture of sights, sounds, smells, and touch in this fictional world. Um, and there's a fascination with it. So you can condemn it in, in, in moral terms to be sure, but uh, there, there is an absolute fascination with, um, uh, with the actual um, sensory details. And uh, so in, in some ways, it's almost like a challenge against all that discourse on, on, on uh, normative elegance that we talked about earlier, that it, it may claim to have a moral edifice or some sort of aesthetic justification, but here it has no chance to, to be developed at all, whereas the world can only be appreciated through vulgarity. And uh, that is something that almost um, go against whatever moral, moral premise you want to build this book on, because that takes, kind of takes precedence sometimes over whatever moral argument it may purport to be making. Uh, so we can come back to this later, but I, I am running a little bit behind. So I'll just go to um, uh, Hong Lam Mung, this other novel that I want to talk about, this 18th century novel about um, an aristocratic family and is, uh, and um, the, the world of Jia Bao Yu and, and all these girls in the, in the garden living the life of ultimate refinement. And what I am interested in regarding this novel is how it redefines elegance and vulgarity and how this is connected to um, its commitment to and concomitant questioning of the lyrical ideal I'll I will try to explain. So good taste in a novel is when, when it comes up a discussion is really an implied oppositional aesthetic. So for example, um, this is chapter 27. This is the point when all the young characters about you and all his female cousins have moved into a big garden. And most of them don't get to leave except Bao Yu. Uh, he has slightly more freedom. So Tan Chun, his um, half sister said to him, when, when you, just like last time, when you got me the willow branch uh, basket, the incense box, et cetera, et cetera, the little clay burner, these are little things that he bought. Um, but, and she really liked them, but the others fancied them too and looted them as if they were treasures and Bao Yu laughed. So you want those things, they're not worth much. Just give 500 coins to the lads and they will bring you cartloads of them. Tan Chun said, what would the lads know? You could pick out what is unadorned yet uncommon, the simple and unaffected items, just bring me lots of them. So in other words, what Tan Chun, what this young lady is saying is that um, they have a right to define value that is separate from market value. And that is a proposition that is unthinkable in Jinping Mei in this earlier novels because everything there is linked to market value. But here they're saying that, well, you can look at an ordinary thing, but you can see something unusual in them and declare it an elegant thing and a refined thing. This is related to the kind of self-conscious elegance that I was talking about earlier. So that's, it, it is really in this spirit that um, uh, Bao Yu calls himself Su Zhong Yo Su, the Yiga Su, that I'm the, but the most vulgar, vulgar people. I do not want to have dealings with such people because the context of this is that Jia Yu Chun, um, a uh, big complex history about the character, but he's an official who comes for a visit and his, and Bao Yu's cousin, Xi Xiang Yun said that you really have to go and entertain him because as she says, when the host is refined, the guest comes calling often. This is a, just a common saying. Um, so when Bao Yu calls himself the most vulgar of vulgar people, of course, he doesn't believe that, but he is saying that uh, as a kind of rejection of what usually is defined as refinement and, and all the rules of social engagement. Again, we're coming back to this question of redefining what is valuable, which is not to say that the novel does not have many, many passages that give you consensual views of elegance that seems to be agreed upon by everybody. It takes absolute positive pleasure in a lot of details about what should be 
put on what surface. So in one place, for example, uh, uh, the maids are bringing Li Zhi to, from one room to another and they're discussing what sort of plates they should use. So Li Zhi should be paired with um, this type of um, uh, white plate, um, some sort of amber, amber plate, I suppose. And, and it, so Hong Mong too, like Jinping Mei has a lot of description of things, but it, um, and, 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 um, and, and this is another example about embroidery. So this is, uh, the, in this chapter, the grandmother is, uh, they, they're having a big New Year's party. And, um, and the grandmother said that she wants to display this Hui pattern, Hui Wen embroidery. And it's created by the uh, well-born maiden Hui Niang for her own pleasure. Uh, she goes on to describe it. It was not something one could buy in the marketplace. All the flowers embroidered on the screen were modeled on flower paintings by Tang Song Yuanming masters. That was why his master in colors had his basis in elegance, has uh, had his basis in elegance and handicraft. That that it, it is really different from all these uh, lush sensual. Um, beautiful things on the, in the marketplace and so on and so forth. So in, in a passage like this, you would, you would think that, well, if you go outside this household, this will be what everybody agreed on as well. So it's not as if the, the, the novel is constantly setting up its own rules. It has a lot of um, objects that it agree, is, that is the agreed upon um, material basis of that elegant world. But Nevertheless, there is in this concern with elegance always um, a little bit of anxiety that you should not be um, um, undertaking all this elegant activity. You, you should have also a kind of, you should have a kind of distance from it, a kind of playful spirit about it um, that, um, that allows you to set yourself apart to show that you are part of this world, but also you are, you are just playing. You are also somewhat above it. So that that is why in in, in all these uh, young people in the garden, they form a poetry club. And if you look at the poems in a the poetry club, there's a lot of role play in it. Uh, I won't go through all the examples, but um, if you look at um, Shi Sang Yun, this aforementioned cousin of Bao Yu, uh, writing this poem about facing chrysanth chrysanthemums. Um, she talks about, with careless ease, I sit bareheaded by the fence in the cold fragrance, chanting lines and hugging my knees. So a girl cannot be bareheaded and she does not sit hugging her knees. Okay, so this is um, a, the image of a scholar. Of course, in the translation, if I choose to use he, then it would be totally different than he, she could just be writing a poem describing a scholar. Uh, but it's ambiguous in that way. It could also be I, it, it, it could be um, Shi Sang Yun, this young girl playing the, the role of a scholar. And why does, why does play matter in such a case? It, play gives you distance. It gives you distance from an elegant activity and turn it into something playful. And this is something that um, uh, they themselves talk about as well. Um, so at, at one point, um, Sang Ling, uh, this concubine of Xue Pan, um, wants to learn to write poetry. And she talks about writing it just for fun. And Tan Chun and Dai Yu um, both said, who among us is not doing it for fun, for a lark? We're not doing it in earnest. So this idea of not doing it in earnest is what sets, what makes an elegant activity more truly elegant for them because it is done in a playful spirit. That is why also you need somewhat incongruous combination of poetry and barbecue because at one scene uh, in, in the middle of the novel, they were doing it after barbecuing venison. And uh, one of the young cousins, one of the cousins, Xu Shang Yun said that this is just, um, this, this is really, um, uh, and Lin Dayu thinks that this, this is too much. This is, there's, there's something um, messy about this. Uh, but Xu Shang Yun said that, um, this, this is what is great about it, uh, be, uh, because a gentleman of spirit has his own brand of romantic elan. Xu Zhenming Shi Zifeng Liu. So all of you who try to look so dainty and lofty, you are just being tiresome. So we're eating meat and, and making a mess. And that is and to combine that with 
poetry is was great. And the commentator Red Engstone agree, agrees with her. And the whole setup of the scene is, is um, going back to what I said earlier about combining, um, doing, creating unexpected combinations of going beyond the norm in order to prove that you are truly elegant. Um, but no matter how elegant, and here we go back to the money talk I talked about earlier, and elegant activities need to be paid for. And in this particular case, they form a poetry club, but they need somebody to um, finance it. So they invite Wang Sifeng to become the overseer of the poetry club. And Wang Sifeng said that, um, well, I can write neither poetry nor prose. I'm just a vulgar person, right? And she sees through their rules right away. Um, what is this nonsense about inviting me to be the overseer? Obviously, you just wanted me to become the copper merchant bringing you cash. And that's precisely correct. Uh, although Li Wan then um, gives a very, very, uh, give this long uh, um, objection to Wang Sifeng, but in fact, this is correct. They want Wang Sifeng to pay for it. And Wang Sifeng happily pays for it. Um, she said, if I don't join the poetry club and spend a few strings of cash, wouldn't I be declaring myself in open rebellion against the Grand, Grand View Garden, against that one? Would I still survive here? So he pays 50, um, um, he pays 50 tails. And, in, and, and um, actually in one of the scenes of Link verse Wang Sifeng even uh, made a first line. He, she said, it's just an uncouth line. Um, a vulgar line, but they, they told her, well, the more uncouth, the better, just gives a line and you take care of your own business. And so this is her line, the north wind howled all through the night, it's just a plain line, a simple line. So if you look at Wang Sifeng paying for the poetry club, if you look at the whole setup of that story, then it would seem that it's not a problem, right? Um, elegant activities need economic support and it can be, it can be done. Wang Sifeng can pay for it and there's no contradiction at all. Uh, nevertheless, there is, a, a, there is anxiety uh, about talking about money and um, the young people in the garden are almost willfully ignorant about money. So at one, in one scene, one of the maids is sick and a doctor comes and another maid has to pay the doctor and she doesn't know how much is one tail of silver. Um, and she picks up a piece and thought, well, maybe we should take a bigger piece. And the old lady, there's an old woman there who said that this piece is half of a five tail ingot. It must weigh two tails at the very least. Since we don't have any silver shears, you should just keep that and choose a smaller piece. So even a maid does not know, never mind the master and mistresses. And it's not, a, it's not so simple actually that and you, to judge the, it's not like the way we use money, right? It's, how to how to judge the weight of broken pieces of silver, how to cut it if it's not the right size, how to weigh it and so on. So it's, it's actually quite complicated as you can see from all these pictures. They also cannot recognize a pawn ticket. There's one scene that some, in one scene, someone has pawned a coat and the pawn ticket is just floating around but they cannot recognize it. So um, you have on the one hand, this kind of anxiety about um, kind of this, determined um, ignorance about money matters as somehow folded into this idea of self-conscious elegance. But in fact, the economic reality does stare you in the face. And, and um, at some point in the novel, when, when uh, the, um, these girls are become aware of the fact that they, they can perhaps economize, there is a whole discussion of whether you can create a profitable garden. And, what, that, what is behind that is really a, a bigger discussion on utilitarian purpose versus aesthetic sensibility. So they, they start talking about um, putting the resources of the garden to good use. But in the middle of that discussion, uh, they bring up all kinds of uh, essays. One of the essays they bring up is Juicy on not giving up on oneself, on Bu Zi Qi Wen. Um, and um, in that, in that essay, Juicy talk about, it's not quoted in the book, but in that essay, um, Juicy said that uh, for all things under heaven are but things, but if a, if a thing has one aspect that can be of use, it would not be discarded by the world. How can we say that humans do not measure up to things? So everything can be of use and you cannot give up on yourself. You have to make yourself useful. But of course, the premise of this story is that this is a useless stone. This is our protagonist in his earlier 
uh, incarnation is a, is a stone that is deemed unworthy to repair heaven. And so his coming into the world, living this, or, uh, living this life of love and sensibility is a kind of compensation for being a useless stone. So can a useless stone create a useful garden? That really becomes a paradox. So when they're talking about whether to make the garden useful, they also quote a master ji, which doesn't exist, a ji zi. And um, so I, I won't go into the detail of that text because again, you know, in the interest of time, but what is interesting is why do they need all these academic discussions, right? Uh, so when Li Wan Chai, Bao Chai and Tan Chun for indulging in pedantic discourse instead of attending to proper business, Bao Chai replies, the proper business is found in learning. If we do not raise a discussion through learning, then we will sink to the vulgarity of the marketplace. So in other words, even the most practical minded among these young women, Bao Chai and um, Tan Chun, even they are kind of caught up in this anxiety of not talking about money. Uh, but, so why is learning necessary for devising an economic policy? So if they're serious about using learning to elevate um, an, an economic discussion, why do they quote a fictitious text that doesn't exist? Um, why do they quote an obscure essay by Juicy that is not even in his collection? Why do they need to do that when the idea of profit in Confucian thought is in any case um, problematic and there's the many, many text that you can cite for that purpose, right? Why do you have to go through all these rhetorical maneuvers? Well, one must, I guess, attribute it to some, some real residual concern about talking about money. Um, and of course, the, the reforms don't have very good consequences. But it has rather baleful consequences because all these old women then enter the garden and then give everybody a hard time because they watch every flower, every leaf being wasted and then they get uh, they get to police the young women. So it, 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 the results are not very good. It also means that Tan Chun is being put in the position that she has to um, challenge uh, uh, this biological uncle of hers and um, to show that in order to be effective, you have to negate sentiment, sentimentality and so on. So it, in other words, it sets into motion a lot of destructive forces that the garden, even as it tries to save itself, set in motion forces that is ultimately beyond its control and then that are ultimately also destructive. So I want to use the last five minutes of my talk to um, focus on a particular episode. So all, where um, th this idea of redefining elegance and vulgarity come to um, come to um, come to a kind of crisis. Uh, so what we have in that episode is uh, uh, this um, peasant woman, Granny Liu, making a second visit to the garden and coming into contact with this Miao Yu, this resident nun in the garden. She, she lives in the convent in, in the garden and she is the one who is obsessed about purity and refinement. And she comes into contact with this most vulgar um, common country woman. So about Miao Yu, so she is the one who is living in the garden and she, when we first um, uh, encounter her is through a riddle in chapter five. And we know that she's not going to end well, that you want to be pure, but can you remain pure? It's called emptiness, but it's the emptiness real. What a pity that she of gold and jade should be mired in mud and filth. So we know that she will end up being, being defiled, being, um, um, being destroyed because of her own obsession with purity, but we are not there yet. Um, uh, so we have we have Mel Yu on the one hand, and then Liu Lao, Liu, um, Granny Liu is in 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 the in um, in the description of her. She's often compared to people, animals, and objects. Like like she's compared to a cow with a hearty appetite, with a fuzzy worm. Uh, with a locust, and there, there's several descriptions about her like that, as if she is some sort of lower life form that they all delight in her. Of course, she she acts the part of the court jester in that in in those episodes. But there's also something about her that is everything that is against literati taste, something that is so common that is almost like some sort of rude primitive life force. And 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 here they come into combination because. Um, uh, 
this country woman is being led by uh, the matriarch of the family and going through the garden uh, with, with all the members of the family. And when the matriarch enters into this convent of um, this kind of hermitage of the, uh, of the nun, of, of Miao Yu, um, Miao Yu gives her tea in a, a small covered teacup from the Changhua reign, from the Changhua reign is, um, is the 15th century. So uh, a beautiful antique cup. And later on, after this group leaves, and then who remains behind are, are Bao Yu, Dai Yu, and uh, Bao Chai, the, the three main characters in the book. And Miao Yu said that uh, she wants to throw that cup away. And uh, because she feels that the cup has been contaminated by um, Granny Liu. And Bao Yu, um, um, insist Bao, Bao Yu suggests that she shouldn't throw it away, but but she wants he, he, she will he will arrange to have it given to Granilio as a present, which which happens, uh, which eventually happens, and Granilio is very very um, uh, grateful. But Mel Yu is so obsessed with purity that she said that if I had drunk from it, I would rather break it than give it to her. Anyway, so and then beyond this encounter, what we have this scene is that. Uh, Miao Yu, this this nun actually is she, perhaps shouldn't call her nun. She she keeps her hair. So this religious person um, invites the the three three of the main characters, the three main characters into her inner sanctum uh, to drink tea, and she offers them tea in 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 some very curious vessel. She she gives um, tea to Bao Chai, one of the main characters, um, in this cup called Ban Bao Jia. These are not common characters, and this is a very precious cup uh, because on it are inscribed the words that it has been a treasure of a third century aristocrat, and that Sudongpo, the famous um, poet, scholar, official, also um, uh, saw it in the 11th century. So it's a really precious cup. What exactly does it look like? It's hard to imagine. It's maybe some sort of jade vessel that is made to look like a bronze vessel. But anyway, why does it have such an odd name? So Zhao Ruchang, the famous uh, Hong Lomong scholar, thinks that the cup reflects Bao Chai's hypocrisy based on the pun ban bao jia, because it, that phrase can mean covering up what is fake. And this 19th century commentator goes into a lot of uh, um, character analysis on reaching more or less the same conclusion that this is all about covering up, not telling the truth, um, and so on. I, I won't go into the detail of how he arrives at that conclusion. We can do that later if you're interested. Lin Da Yu, the other characters, also get a very interesting cup. It's called Dian Xi Chao. It looks like an arms bow, but smaller. And it, the characters are written in pearl drop seal script. And if you're curious about what is this pearl drop seal script. This is one example here. And so why is the cup called that? So this 19th century commentator, Zhang, Zhang Xinji thinks that it's because see the rhinoceros horn is about um, conveying meaning. Uh, it, it means the heart is, it, it, it has something to do with the ineffable emotions in the heart. That's why she gets such a cup, but it's chao. It's also called chao, chao means, then Si Chao Chao is also fake or false, right? So it refers to things being fictional. And Zhou Ru Chang thinks that it's a pun for a phrase that means a perverse sensibility, and he thinks it reflects on Lin Dai Yu. So Shen Chong Wen, a famous 20th century novelist, thinks that the cups for Bao Chai and Dai Yu actually convey criticism of Miao Yu that she is unnatural, worldly, and disingenuous, that her purity and refinement are mostly superficial. So my point here is that not that it has anything in particular to say about the character of Miao Yu, Bao Chai, or Dai Yu. It's just interesting that these two super elegant, um, precious teacups also con are made up of words that puns with words that mean false, or fictive, fake, pretense, strange, or perverse. And in other words, do we see this some sort of broader critique of the illusion of refinement and purity? Because whatever you say about um, uh, Miao Yu, her sense of um, her difference, her, uh, her sense of being different from everybody else is actually just a very exaggerated version of what the sensibility of Bao Yu and, and the other people and the young, and the, and the, and, and, his cousins, that their conviction that they have um, a higher understanding of what is valuable. It is a more 
distorted, perhaps a more exaggerated version of Tan Chun saying that you can pick out a common thing and make it valuable. This idea of defining your own value in this case becoming something that is so precious that it becomes a little bit um, perverse. You, you see this clearly when Bao Yu is being offered a jade cup and, um, and uh, he said that, well, this is a vulgar vessel and Mao Yu is quite offended. How can you call this a vulgar vessel? And, and, and Bao Yu said that, um, when I enter your domain, I naturally adopt your standards and demote all things made of precious metals and jade as vulgar vessels. Again, going back to this idea of redefining value. Um, and, and then uh, Mel Yu offers them tea in these uh, exotic, wonderful cups, okay? And they're discussing what is this tea made of? What is the water that makes this uh, tea. As I said earlier, the discourse on tea is 90% the discourse on water. So here they're discussing what is this water made of. Dai Yu then asked Mao Yu, is this also made with last year's rainwater? Mao Yu sneered, someone as refined as you turn out to be a most vulgar person who can't tell even who can't even tell the taste of water. This is the snow on the plum blossoms that I collected five years earlier when I lived at the coiled dragon fragrance temple at the dark two mountain. All I got was what filled that porcelain jar in ghostly blue. I have been so chary of using it that I had it buried. It's only this summer that I opened it. I used it once. This is now the second time. How can you fail to discern the taste? How can rainwater saved from last year have this lightness and purity? How can it be worth drinking? So this is really the first time, right, that Lin Dai Yu, who consider herself so refined and in fact, who calls a, a gift from a prince as unworthy because it's some stinky man, he, she doesn't want to have anything to do with it. So she is the epitome of refinement, but here she is called a most vulgar person. So the person who calls her that is Mel Yu because Mel Yu is setting herself even above these um, um, uh, elegant young people coming into her own rooms. But what is this water? Okay, so she's collecting this water from plum blossoms, but she has to store them in this Wei Lian Qing. So the it, what, what I translate as ghostly blue is actually ghost face blue. It's a type of porcelain that um, when, when it comes out of the kiln, you, you, see, you see the color streaked in some um, um, deliberately uneven way. So that's why it's called ghost face. So there's something kind of dark about it. And the place she, she collected this is called, um, what, what, I, what we translated as dark tomb is actually Xuan tomb is Xuan Mu. Is oops is um is a um the, the mountain is called Xuan Mu Mountain and is is called that because it's the tomb of a famous person from the fifth century, but Xuan also means dark and mysterious. So it's also it's, it's, it's also a phrase that co conveys darkness or mystery. So in, what, what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's supposed to be the, the purest of things, but all this burying of the water, all this uh, dark tomb and all this ghost face and so on, it, it, it has all these connotations of, of death, in fact, reminding us of burying, plum, uh, burying flowers, the scene of Lin Dai Yu. So, we talked earlier about elegance and exclusion, right? So this is ultimate exclusion, but this exclusion and preciosity also is connected to, to death and destruction. So um, to conclude, when we talk about the paradoxes of taste, we talk about conforming to consensus and defying the consensus earlier. And here obviously it's about defying the consensus and also setting up your own rules, uh, setting up, uh, um, uh, negating the material basis of both negating the material basis of taste and also embracing it, but also setting up your own rules and so on. Um, but what what I think what is at, the, at what ultimately comes what this comes down to is all these separate spheres: aesthetics, ethics, and economics. It, I think politics doesn't quite enter into it, but certainly. Um, um, the idea of aesthetic judgment, if it is about what is beautiful and ugly, and if ethics is about what is good and bad, and if economics is about what is efficient and inefficient, you see, looking back at the tradition, some attempt to somehow fuse the 
at least the ethics and aesthetics part in, in all these uh, definitions of elegance as proper and correct and so on. Um, but there's kind of built in tensions with it. And um, this idea of uh, self-conscious elegance, it can, it can be quite liberating. Then you, you can go against all those rules, but you can, con you can question conventional standards, but ultimately it's about your power to impose value on the world, to define your own sets of rules. And that, that, can, be, that can be quite um, a seductive idea, but if you look at how, um, uh, how in the case of Miao Yu, then when you have an exaggerated version of it, you um, see all these um, unhappy associations with death and um, a kind of um, a new kind of fakeness almost. And the, ultimately the, the, the judgment is not only against that you, the unease is really about the, that whole world that this, this attempt to, to define your own values may also be ultimately a failure. Although it's worth trying because that's the only promise of beauty that we have. So with this, I will end. I'm sorry, I go over time. And this uh, is the information that I'm uh, supposed to give you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for attending. Many, many, let's start again. Many thanks, uh, Wai. That's a fascinating talk that uh, ranges across so much time and uh, text. Um, very interesting idea. That almost, I see this sort of the. Um, this idea of elegance and vulgarity as being a, a game to which, you know, you either know the rules or you don't know the rules or you make your own rules. Um, and so that whatever happens, the rules change all the time too. So, thank so, you. So, um, um, Alison, is this the time to stop share? Is this yes, yes, okay. let's, let's stop share and then we'll go to the questions, um, the Q and A's, uh, which I will, there is one question already. Um, uh, okay, so from Xinmeng Guo, Guo Xinmeng. Thank you, Professor Li. I'm particularly interested in the word jiji uh, or confidant um, that you brought out in the previous passage uh, when the buyer paid a whole house for a painting upon the words of the painter who purports his work to be the buyer's confidant. I wonder if the concept of confidence is relevant to the concept of elegance in any way. Does it speak to some facts in terms of the values held by literati? Thank you. Is that clear? So the, the whole idea of the confidant, the duty. Um, right, right. That... So um, I, I, think, I think that particular story is a very curious one because um, I, I just thought the punchline is not what I expected. I, I, I thought after seeing that you are the soulmate of that painter, then we are leaving behind market value, right? We, we, then he should own it because the one who is the soulmate of the painter should be the, he, his ownership is justified because of the spirits of the whole thing. And, and why, why does he then um, have to give up his estate in exchange for it? So in, in the discourse on friendship, on, on um, knowing the other person and so on, it, 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 I feel that that is a separate discourse from all this idea about elegance and vulgarity and so on, that, that is really more about sentiment and uh, sensibility and um, Whereas uh, all the discourse of elegance and vulgarity does have a kind of social aspect to it, is about how you present yourself to the world. Whereas um, um, Jizi is is really about knowing another person and um, mm. finding ultimate value and justification in in knowing another person, perhaps. Thank you. Um, we have a question from my colleague, Leo Xin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Wai Yi, for this wonderful talk. It certainly makes me want to go to my bookshelf and pick up my copies of Jinping Mei and Hong Lomak. It's a shame that we aren't able to host you on campus, which I agree with totally. Uh, my question, perhaps an unfair one, is 
how would one go about gauging how the uneducated thought about the ideas of elegance and vulgarity? So I, I would say that it's almost impossible to tell from the textual evidence because they are the ones that are silenced, right? They, they, they are the ones who, who don't have a voice. Um, so when the literati represent their voice, is is you, you can't say that we are getting their voice. It's just how their voice is being imagined. Mm -hmm. But that that is all we have. Um, yeah, I so I, I I don't know how to how to answer that. I can, I mean, if I think back on how I grew up. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose. Um, You, you on, on some level it it, it is just um i don't know how i don't it's, it's actually a bit hard to explain so i i think it's the romanticism of the um of the poor is really the privilege of the rich right so it's this Qian Yong who's who said that um the wealth and position is it really makes you vulgar is because he already has it. And, and that's why he can talk about those who um, don't use it well, then they are becoming vulgar and so on. But so the, so where do we actually recuperate the, the, uh, the uneducated is, is, I feel that it's almost an, an impossible task. But all I can say is that the educated, the one who gets to wield the brush when they imagine it, first of all, sometimes they imagine this uneducated person as the one who is simple and has, has the, sometimes as the, maybe some, someone who can even transcend all this discourse of taste. In some ways you can, you can say that that is the depiction of Granny Liu in, in, um, in Hong Le Mong, that she's the one who, um, it, when when she looks at this material aban abundance of of that world, um, the the only way she can explain it is that it's it's like a nianhua, it's like a New Year drawing, um, because that's her only visual point of reference, right? But if you look at how Granny Liu is um, described in in Hong Le Mong, she is the one who who has. Um, affinities with Jia Bao Yu. She's the one who falls asleep on Jia Bao Yu's bed. She's the one who looks at the mirror and gets entranced by her own reflection and, and gets all confused about what is illusion and what is reality. In other words, she's the one who gets to be placed with Bao Yu in, in, um, in the representation of the most fundamental questions in the novel. So at least from Cao Xiexin, from the author's imagination, the, the, the simplest, the, the the poorest, the one who is most devoid of any aesthetic judgment, because you know she sticks flowers over her head, like in in a way, I'm sure that is pretty tasteless. That 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 person uh, gets at the truth of the matter. So maybe it's not that what she thinks about elegance and vulgarity, but that she can transcend that discourse into something what that ultimately what matters or what is the nature of reality. It's not that she has the answer, but that she gets to epitomize that problem. There's a distinction there, right? So it's not as if she's a representative of the peasantry who gets the truth of the of, of the matter, but not that at all, but rather that she is is kind of combined fingerly linked to Jia Bao Yu as as the as the person who represents the most important problems in the book. I don't know whether that's uh... okay. Um, I have another question from another colleague, Chris, Chris Ray, um, who's about to test me on my Chinese here. Thank you, Professor Lee. I have many questions. Uh, like Guo De Gang's response to Fan San Su on the delights of being a Su Red, but we'll ask just one here. What is your take on literary or popular culture attempt? to bring together the elegant and the vulgar, for example, with formulations like Ya Su Gong Xiang or Sha. Mm -hmm. 
So, so that is something else altogether, right? So when, when we talk about Ya Su Gong Shang, that is what we all aspire to. There's a kind of a literary ideal that you can speak to different levels, different registers, and so on. Um, but Alison, the first part of, of the question, I didn't quite oh, get. Oh, sorry. Um, it, maybe maybe has... we can see on chat. Yes, it, could it be on chat, Connie? Could you maybe copy it onto chat? Yeah, here it is, it's on chat. Yeah. Can you see it there? Oh, uh, I actually don't know about Guo De Gang's Fan San Su. Okay, maybe Chris can elaborate. Attempts to bring together the elegant and the vulgar. Yeah, so, so, um, so of course the period that we're talking about is also um, uh, the, the great age of drama. And that, that is one example where the, what is elegant and vulgar actually mix together quite seamlessly. In fact, it's almost becomes a convention, right? That you, you have very elegant areas of, um, uh, elegant areas professing romantic love and, and um, uh, some pretty coarse jokes and and the juxtaposition of that is supposed to feel right so it is so it is of course uh, is what um professor Ri refers to as ya su gong shang of mm -hmm. different people from different social strata being able to enjoy together but also the literati also getting the joke about about the incongruous combination as itself being a source of enjoyment or maybe a vision of totality depending how on how you look at it um and also th this is uh, the period when they uh, 16th 17th century when they collect all these um folk songs and uh um when they believe that um it's really among the people that you have true poetry where this is what um what the kai sen said Zhen shi nai zai min jian, true poetry is really among the people that's why Shanko and all the, these popular songs is, is really where you find the spirit of true, true poetry and so on. So if you think about that type of interest in popular literature and um, uh, um, vernacular literature, it is in, in some ways also about the literati redefining boundaries about what is elegant and what, what is vulgar, being able to embrace this whole new area um, it's a way to expand, expand, um, expand the horizon, I suppose. Yeah. Right. That whole rebarbarization that yeah. concept. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. We have uh, several more questions. I'll, I'll run through. Uh, Fan Wu, um, thank you so much for the lecture. In Ren Jian Su Hua, Wang Guowei proposes that a lyricist should write about real scenery and emotions rectify the self-conscious elegance demonstrated by the refined lyrical style of Jiang Kui. To what mm -hmm. extent can the concept slash discourse regarding spontaneity and genuineness resolve mm -hmm. the tension between real elegance and self-conscious elegance? So this is a really, this is a really, really good question. Um, so Wang Guowei, of course, has his own bias, right? So he doesn't like Nan Song, Nan Song. So when he talks about Buge, um, this spontaneous um, description of real emotions as, in some ways, spontaneity is the answer to um, any anxiety about self-conscious elegance, because then you are just natural, right? That you, mm -hmm. you, um, you're just being truthful, and uh, you're not. You, you, you are in some sort of sublime indifference to how the world is looking at you. You, you are only concerned about giving a truthful account of your own emotions. And so I agree that in some ways that is almost an answer um, to it. But isn't it true that that is possible perhaps only in poetry, but because once you have fiction, once you are, um, giving the richness of a fictional world, you're putting these characters in context and um, uh, they, that, 
that it is really about their reaction to the world as well. They, they have to be seen by each other. They're in a complex social world and everybody's interacting and um, not just being totally natural in, in a sense. Or maybe another way to put it is that if you believe that in Holomon, for example, that some characters are just natural, that, that they can go, go beyond these boundaries because they are, they are just natural, then Cao Xueqin is not natural. That the author, in giving you an example of someone who is totally natural and spontaneous, is, is really putting that person in a social world and thinking about what, what that will mean. Um, so maybe in this case, it's true that maybe if Zabao, you can be saved from um, the, the conundrum of Mel Yu, you can say that of, of, the, of the nun is because she, he is a more natural person, perhaps. Um, but then the, what, what I, I guess what I was trying to think through is, is, is no longer a, a question of um, aesthetic standards, right? Because uh, this, this idea of the um, elegance and so on, it's not just about aesthetic judgment and social judgment when it comes in, when it becomes a question of defining the values of your world and living by your own rules and so on, then, then even being natural does not save you from it because you, you're still caught in, in that, you're still caught in that web in a sense, right? Yeah. So you, you may not be as affected as Mel Yu, but you still think that you can decide whether something is valuable or beautiful by, by your own rules. And you can be totally natural and spontaneous about it. But in the meantime, the world you live in has its own economic needs, has, is caught up in all kinds of forces that will bring it down. And you are not in a position to correct that no matter how natural and spontaneous you are. Um, working you hard. <laughs> uh, another colleague, uh, Bruce Rusk, I am intrigued by the complex way your talk links the elegance and vulgarity of literary activities with that of the material culture. I'm conscious, I'm sorry, I'm curious how you think of the relationship between fiction, self sure as a genre, often perceived as vulgar, even when written in relatively elegant language. Do Mingqing literati novels through their own form or language enact a kind of redemption of the vulgar, for example? Is this reflected at all in their treatment of material culture in particular? Yeah, I, I actually don't have an answer to that, I don't think, because it's true that they're all, um, so, so Jinping Mei is an extreme example, um, but I, I was reading uh, this um, Xiu Ta Ye Shi, which is a really terrible book. Um, it, it's one of the erotic novels from the 17th century, but it's, it's not like Jinping Mei, it's very repetitive, the prose is very crude and so on. Uh, a lot of sex, but uh, very badly described. But what, one thing I was struck by was how two things. One is, is prose is so crude, but it, when it switches to classical Chinese, in, because these characters write letters to each other, then it becomes much better because the vernacular as a medium is just very hard to control, I think, for them at that time. And um, uh, the other thing is that in the middle of all the sex, which is very crudely described, you have a description of a room that is almost like a very elegant room. So it's like the, the, this, this person is, he's the son of a minister. So he's very well, the author, Li Tianchang, he's from a very high social class. So um, he, he could not help, but then uh, give you that kind of description. So in other words, when, when you deal with the vernacular medium, it's not that the vernacular medium would, would invite you automatically to describe um, the, the, the material reality, but there's no necessary connection there, but sometimes it does take place. But when it does take place, does it then redeem um, the, the, the book as a whole? Does it elevate it? I'm not so sure. Um, 
but, but Bruce, I feel that you are getting at a very important question, which is even maybe there's a confusion of discourse here because it's true that, you know, when we talk about Ya Zheng and, and all that, um, especially Xunzi and all those people, they're not talking about material stuff. They're they are talking about certain idea of what is proper, certain idea of what is right, morally right, aesthetically right, and so on. So, and, and that kind of discourse has a level of abstractness, even when they're talk about, talking about literary style and so on. Whereas when I get to Jinping Mei and Hong Mong, I, I was actually a lot of the times looking at the way they talk about stuff and um, things, real things. And um, so, so one can, I, I think legitimately ask whether there's a slippage there that, that should one use categories in the same way and I think that's something that I really should think about a bit more. Um, I mean, but as for the uh, social being a, a lower genre, that, that, that is, I think at least by, by Hong Lo Mung, by the time of Hong Lo Mung is, is we have had enough literati being involved in, in the creation of that type of writing that is, is no longer automatically written off as, as vulgar. Um, but it's true also that Horomo, at, at least part of his claim to, to our attention um, is that uh, the author knows this world, that it, it, it gives you a, a, a very concrete realization of that world, and part a, a lot of it has to do with the, all the all the beautiful things, all the elegant things in that world. And in fact, a lot of modern readers read the book for all that, so that they can relive that beautiful, abundant world. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the Cai Jiajie novels from the 17th century, they are all daughters of prime ministers and so on. Whereas the the, the description of the decor or or the things they're using is, you you can tell that the author didn't know much about it, that he was making it up along the way and was all rather general, but quite different from Hong mm -hmm. However, I do, do not think that if he gives you all those descriptions, it was by way of um, redeeming the vulgarity of, of, um, of the genre. Rather, it was, you know, it belongs to other problematics, right? Whether it's about remembering that world, living that world, the truth of that world, the truth of its experience and so on, but, but not so much in opposition to the vernacular language as something uh, lower necessarily. And especially after Su Ta Yeshi, I really think the vernacular medium is a real challenge. That's why such a talented playwright can make a mess of it when he tries to write his erotic uh, fiction. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, onwards. Um, another colleague, Su Xiao Wan. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. Lee. It is fascinating to listen to you analyzing and even dissecting the paradox of elegance and vulgarity. The Ming literati versus merchants competition for taste policing authority is quite eye-opening. I'm wondering whether that could also be observed from the perspective of the institution of knowledge. Thank you. So who controls the knowledge in this case? Um, um, not institutions, not the examination system, not anything like that. But so if we're talking about um, uh, institutions of knowledge as in who pervade those knowledge and in what form, then we're talking about the book trade and so on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, um, I hope I'm not misquoting Clunas, but I, I think one of his arguments is actually writing a book like um, Wen Zhenheng, writing a book like Zhang Wuzhi is one way to um, kind of um, reestablish the, the, the boundaries of literati identity and, and setting, uh, making clear his difference from, um, from merchants and so on. Um, but but that that actually there's a problem there because if the whole point about um, your your um, if, if the whole point is your sense of being encroached upon as a group by all these upstart merchants, then why do you want to put your knowledge into words? Then that gets so that 
spokes and then that will be circulated and then more people will find out about it. Then so what where where is some um, where does in other words formalizing all these distinctions about what is elegant and what is vulgar and then uh, letting it become part of general knowledge, institutionalize it, so to speak, right? Because once you do that, then your claim to distinction is, is gone because everybody shares that knowledge. So, yeah. I, I, so I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Chu uh, Lu. Thank you for your talk, Professor Li. I wonder how does the, the, the visibility and invisibility of the labor or the servant complicate the boundaries between and creation of elegance and vulgarity. For instance, the lad Xiao Tong Xiao Fu mentioned in the case of Galian and Tan Chun in the story of the stone. Many thanks. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of labor behind all this um, elegant stuff, right? And um, they they don't get a, a lot of um, they don't get a lot of attention. You're right, because if you if you look at it from their angle, then it's about labor, then it's about hard work, and mm -hmm. all these may seem totally frivolous, right? I don't think Gaolian stops to think about what about that lad following me carrying the wine flask to make himself part of a very elegant, beautiful picture of looking for plum blossoms after snow. I don't think his consideratedness extend that far. And even in Hong Lamu, all the mates, because the mates that we get to know are not the ones doing a lot of work. They are as, um, as a really, as they actually like, um, mistresses, right? They're, they're like young ladies, right? they don't do much work. Um, I, I sometimes think there's almost a conscious attempt to, to um, not to make light of labor, but to like sensibility is somehow implicitly, almost implicitly pitted against productive labor in the book, because remember how Linda, you never mix anything. I mean, it takes her a year to make a little, little sachet thing. And like, you don't like convention, conventional productivity, as I said, the whole economic framework of what is efficient and what is not efficient is so alien to that world. And Linda, you never does any productive labor for sure, right? Maybe Xue Bao Chai does, yeah. Well, she sweeps the flowers. She does do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're carrying on. Andreas Tao, thanks a lot for the content rich lecture. I was just wondering why it is so important for the characters in Homo to behave in a not vulgar way. Do you think holding a lot of materials or money are prerequisites for people to behave elegantly? You have to be basically. Well, on, on, the, on the contrary, well, I don't, so the whole point is that they don't think of um, themselves as um, necessarily, it, it, it's not that they position themselves as elegant as opposed to everybody else. It's, it's what, what really is at, at the bottom of this is, is really their sense of, not trying, I mean, of, of breaking free from all these constraints and then living by their own rules and being playful and not following conventional models of elegance. Um, so there is a degree of self-consciousness there, but uh, but money is, is um, they, I mean, if anything, there's there are all these deliberate manifestos saying that money is, can cannot, that they, they're against all these um, um, all the all the all the appearance of refinement that um, material abundance can buy that they're against that right so if you go back to that scene about tension asking about you to buy her little things that cost nothing but that he can spot them as interesting things like poor bu the don't see the 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 unaffected uh, simple things that are that nevertheless have aesthetic value. So, on the contrary, it's it's not you. At, at least according to them, you don't need materials of money to to behave to to live elegantly. But of course, the 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 problem is that they 
are living on top of a lot of money and they don't have to worry about making a living. But having that as the basis of their world, they then also um, don't want to accept um, this idea that uh, you, you, you need, um, that, that elegance calls for its own material basis. Okay, we have a few more questions. How are you doing? Uh, all right? For yeah, yeah. A bit longer. Yeah, okay. Um, there's one from uh, Li Yongyang, Yang Li Long. Thank you. I have a little doubt about vulgarity being equated to Su, exactly. Su has a mm -hmm. wider meaning than merely vulgarity. Mm -hmm. It's true because the word Su is. Well, especially if you think about Ya Yan as being basically um, uh, like Ya Yan in, um, in Lun Yu, a, a lot of people gloss it as just really standard language, right? Like, um, <laughs> like Zhong Yan Cheng Yin kind of standard language. And in that, in that context, Su is really the local custom as opposed to Ya being the standard and central thing. So, um, so absolutely, Su. Also, if you think about Feng Su as um, just a local custom, um, or Tong Su. So it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to mean vulgar, which has um, at, at least in modern English has that um, has that has that negative connotation. Although, if you think about the Vulgate Bible, it, it also has a side of it that really has to do with just. Um, being known by by a lot of people and so on. So I, I would say that this this is almost just um, uh, um I, I wouldn't even in other words I wouldn't even argue for this as necessarily the most felicitous translation, but um I would say it is one of the possible translations. The same goes in Chinese too, right? If you say someone is yongsu, that is negative, but if something is tongsu, then it's just what a lot of people use and so on. So it also has a range right. of meanings. So mapping is not perfect. I, I am absolutely happy to acknowledge that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tongsu, thank you, Professor Li, for the wonderful talk. I found it particularly interesting to use contemporary writings about taste to reread particular episodes in fiction and drama. The descriptions of interior decoration and the use of objects as a way to comment on characters' taste seems to be a literary device that Hong Nong Meng inherited from Jinping Mei. Such a perspective also allows literary scholars to engage the material culture of the time. Would you speak more about your methodology? Mm. So I don't really have much method. I, I'm, I, I just feel I'm really failing horribly in that regard, in the sense that um, I, 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 I wasn't, um, I, I, I don't think of it as, a, as any particular method, right? I, I think of, I guess I think of this as, um, Ultimately, maybe maybe it, it was really what what the problem I begin with is is a very simple problem. Is what I said um, toward the end is about how aesthetics, ethics, and economics they, they everything at each discourse operate by a different set of value. Right? Beautiful, ugly, good, bad, efficient, not efficient. Um, if you're Karl Schmitz, then politics is friend and enemy, but let's not go there. So let's just stick, stick with these three. And then if the, if, so how can aesthetics justify itself is sometimes it's by um, borrowing the terms of ethics or saying that the two actually come together and so on, or uh, less with economics, but certainly with ethics. But the, the way uh, fiction works is because this world is so rich, then you, you see you see as, as the story unfolds, how these different ways of making meaning maybe not, don't come together um, seamlessly or that they, they are fissures, they are, they are bricks and so on. And um, so I, I like to think of that as perhaps the basic problem. And then one way to approach that problem is just when you read a novel is to, to look at all these 
um, the, the details of the world they live in and how um, these problems are borne out by the material concreteness of that world. So I don't start out, in other words, I don't start out with a methodology. I, I just read a book a few times and walk around, try to think about it and see where I, I, I am, you know. And with Jinping Mei, I, I even feel a little bit since she, I feel a little bit um, maybe not so confident because I feel that I, I don't know the book well enough. I, I don't remember as many details from it, but yeah, I have, I have, I'm, I'm sorry to be so primitive. I really have no method. I just read a book as many times as I can and then try to think about it. I frankly think that's the best method around, close reading, um, rereading, re all of those things. I think that's, well, I, I would certainly uh, go for that method myself if I could do it as well as you. Okay, uh, more. We have uh, Ji Wei Xiao. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. Wonderful talk. Can you use the Yasu difference as a criteria to judge the writing itself rather than the characters? I Oh, yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, but that's the that's the interesting part, right? Um, because there then it's not um then then that gets actually that gets to be pretty complicated as well. Uh you have all this definition of Dianya, but uh Guya or whatever, Danya in, in uh, literary um criticism, but nobody defines Su for you. Um, so how, how to <laughs> okay. how to how to define it? Um, because as I said, sometimes when when we read it, it the the most often the, this yasu distinction not not so much in in terms of understanding the nuances of the fictional world, but as a category of literary judgment, it is used most often to talk about levels of style, stylistic registers, and shapes, and what what. It, what is the effect achieved when when you have those shifts and um, and and unexpected combinations and so on? But Su as a negative term as something that is um, that is indicating that it 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 is a failure, it's an aesthetic failure. That that is. You see that in traditional criticism too, and sometimes I don't even get it why they say something is too perhaps it's too common or um, is is a cliche or something. Uh, but it's really quite different from the way we usually use it, right? Like when you look at a painting, and um, when 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 um, when the images are. are, are are too pretty. Sometimes there's a kind of vulgar quality to it, but do we do that with literature as well? I'm thinking. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's a bit hard to put your finger on it. As I said, to talk about registers, yes, and that is very simple, but to attack a style as vulgar in a negative sense of um, uh, offending against a higher beauty um, that that becomes that becomes hard to pin down because people do use it but they use it in quite different way I think mm. um, sometimes in poetry for example some it, at least in the Ming and Qing dynasty it, they they find um, allusions to fiction and um, um, place as poetic illusion, they call it vulgar because you shouldn't do that. That is bringing down the elevation of poetry, but we don't tend to agree with that anymore, right? Um, or um, sometimes they would criticize the, the use of um, certain words as, as being uncouth or, or, um, or vulgar, that's true. But I, I would say at least as a modern reader with, with that kind of poetic criticism, I find it less, less convincing because I feel that they have a very rigid sense of poetic decorum and it's what's offending decorum that is vulgar. And in any case, that type of, um, that type of judgment is used less in, oddly enough, in fiction criticism. They, they, they don't really think about it in those ways. Yeah, Maybe the whole sense of decorum is different as well. 
um, just uh, briefly on that, 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 but also you talked about the, the sort of moral attributes of, of ya. What about su? Is it given the kind of moral, is there a moral judgment attached in the same way to su? I don't think in the early text, no. I mean, in, no. in, um, in, in early text, it's really su, yeah, so it's, it's really about, in oddly enough, it's really regional versus um, supposedly universal, right? right? Um, in the later text, um, does the Su get a, a sense of a problem about something morally reprehensible? I mean, in, in in the prose, you can say that someone is, as I said, yong su or di su or er su or something. Uh, so I suppose in that sense, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, I the reason why I got to this topic is because, as as I said, looking at that Trump picture, it doesn't start. With, it didn't start with him. I mean, it was this was an afterthought. But it it is actually the difficulty of saying why some something is this or that in, as an aesthetic judgment. When you try to um, concretize it, it's actually quite hard, right? Is it the chandelier? Is it the gold? Or is it, what is it? I mean, Everything, <laughs> yeah. Is it because he's a bad person? Well, you know, that too, but yeah. So so I, I, I think, um, yes, certainly in many cases, negative connotations, but not, um, not elevated as definition, like like yeah, is in in the early discourse, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have many more. I, um, I feel as though um, maybe a couple more, at least, to suit, uh, and then perhaps uh, if other people would like uh, like to step out or leave, uh, they could do that. But um, if you would like to continue with a few more questions. Um, that's fine. Yeah. That's okay. yeah. Um, my colleague Chris Ray has come back with um, perhaps here's the, the Guo De Gang is an example of a Su talking back. Guo is a Xiangsheng comedian who was criticized by the CCP for doing vulgar routines during their countering the three types of vulgarity. He responded by doing a routine that passes the word Su, Tong Su, Yong Su, etc. And he's uh, given you a link to the routine for another day. Stefan's answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Calvin Lin, thank you, Professor Lee, for this amazing talk. This may have been addressed, but I'm still wondering whether there are cases where the literati, while participating in these dialogues of elegance and vulgarity, are implicitly discussing political topics, or whether these discussions exist purely in the social and economic realm. I wonder if this is because, from my understanding, uh, I wonder this, I wonder this because from my understanding, politics can often inspire changes in social and economic conditions. Right, right, yeah. So, I mean, there, there are people who, uh, many actually, who read uh, in both cases, the fall of Ximen Qing and, and um, the downfall of the Jia family, they, they see this as implication in some bigger political forces that, uh, that are leading to the destruction of those families. So if, so if you read the narrative of decline as having some broad political reference, then Obviously, the whole discourse on taste can can be seen as a contributing factor, right? That that uh, if if I'm not saying that that's the argument of the book, but um, certainly you can say that um, the the plot line of decline and um, and this all these aesthetic uh, concerns, uh, there is a, a kind of connection there, right? That um, mm -hmm. The garden cannot save itself. They they cannot save themselves, and 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 this this story of decline and fall can be whether that is a political uh, narrative that that is that is I, that is a little bit 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that one. Or in the in the chapter, this is one of the chapters in the book that I um, um, that I just finished. And actually, talking to you all make me realize that there are still a lot of problems I haven't solved. So I don't know whether I should say that I finished it at all. But anyway, in in this chapter, um, there is a Li Yu story in it that actually politics enter into it. Is uh, one of the stories in Shi Lo Chui Ya Lo. Is is um, it starts with these three young men who have a very happy menage um, trois. Very interesting because the the two. Two guys who didn't pass examination decided to turn to um, to become merchants of antiques and um, books and all these elegant things, and um, and then they have a younger lover who is the kind of the their shared catamite. They're married. They have houses outside, but they live in this house of uh, like gathered refinements. They live in this house, so. Um, and they have uh, this trade and they enjoy all these fine things. They also enjoy each other and it's all fine. So, but then the story takes a dark turn because there's a, uh, uh, the story is set in the Jiaxing reign, although it's written after the fall of the Ming dynasty, but it's set in the middle of the 16th century where a very powerful minister, Yan Song and his son, Yan Shifan, uh, always appear as villains in fiction because they're the ones abusing their power. They are known as uh, great collectors, but um, maybe also sometimes told the story is told that they're indiscriminate collectors and so on. So, um, uh, Yan Song, um, um, Yan Shifan, Yan Shifan sets his eyes on this younger lover of the two men. And basically, after a series of um, maneuvers, uh, this young man is castrated and brought into Yan Shifan's household, becomes his. Uh, lover, not lover is the wrong word, becomes his catamite and um, and he is only granted his sweet revenge later when uh, he he take, keeps a record of all Yan Shifan's misdeeds and eventually when uh, the Yan family falls, the Zhaqing emperor summons him and he reports to the emperor what's wrong with this um, Yan family and uh, so he's vindicated in the end. He becomes a Zhongchen. He's a loyal minister, Xiao Zhongchen, a little loyal minister. So if you look at that story, you can see that at least in, in the first part of the book, it, uh, the ones about how these three young men set up this house of um, gathered refinements or gathered elegance or whatever, converged elegance, um, that, that at least in that part of the story, economics and Aesthetics have no contradiction because they have a very profitable trade and they all enjoy these elegant things. They defy a lot of rules about what is elegant, what, what, uh, what is a normal family, and they still have a very good time. But then when politics enter the picture, which is uh, when um, this un uh, the, uh, the, all these uh, machinations of Yan Shifan, then, um, then this young man loses everything. Uh, he's mutilated, he's castrated, but then he, as I said, gets to have uh, his revenge. And that, then the story becomes a moral story and a political story about, um, about how he, um, um, manages to bring about the downfall of Yan Shifan. So that is a story where explicitly politics become part of the picture where politics is the force that, um, uh, shows how fragile this illusion of the power of elegance is, or this self-congratulatory elegance, because you know these two young men, the lovers of this even younger man, ultimately betray him, um, give him up to um, um, to Yan Shifan, and and because they think that they have their families to worry about, and so on. So. On, on all terms, on romantic terms, on aesthetic terms, that, that uh, it, it is almost a questioning of that kind of um, aesthetic ideal of being able to live by, create this world of elegance. And that, that ideal is shattered by, by politics, you can say, in that story. Only um, it's a little bit, ultimately, also a little bit ambivalent because um, this young man whose name is Chen Ru Xiu, uh, Chen Ru Xiu, the, the, the catamite, ultimately becomes the, the person who's able to right political wrongs. So he's the one who is supposed to be the epitome of all this 
concerned with elegance and, and beauty and all that. Uh, and it's true that his world is destroyed, but the fact that he then ultimately acquires political agency because of that, then in some ways, in kind of circuitous ways, also justify that, that world. So it's, it's paradoxical, but I would say that that is one story where politics enters into it very explicitly, not so much in um, um, Hong Lomu or Jinping Mei, although you will find many, many readers of Hong Lomu believing that, 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 that this is all a whole dense web of political reference and maybe all these um, concerns with beautiful things is ultimately um, a, a kind of um, subtext about um, very complex political reality and we're not entering that Soyin world there, right? So, mm. I mean, at least I don't believe it works like that. Um, maybe some general story about decline, yes, but that trans does that translate into some some also some sort of political statement? That is a bit hard to say. Okay. So for you, this is uh, it's been you've been two hours more or less, and this is what almost uh, nine o'clock for you. How much more would you? How many more questions? I mean, there seem to be. Goodness, it says 21. Uh, I don't know if we've actually covered, actually fewer than that. Um, in terms, we've, you've answered a lot already. Um, what do you want to do? There are a few more or, do you, or are, you, are you ready to just um, wrap up? We will answer questions. If people have questions, then people should also feel free to leave if they- um, um, Okay, that's, that's yeah. true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, okay. So an, another of my colleagues, uh, Ren Ren Yang, Thank you, Professor Lee, for the great talk. I'm intrigued by the uneven attribution of elegance and vulgarity to objects, stuff, people, or ideas. Most of the literati or collectors in today's talk are anxious about justifying their discursive authority by playing around the binary of elegance and vulgarity. Are there any cases in your archive that expressly acknowledge that I am a vulgar person, but my, but my ideas or my objects are not. Just to think along the idea of self-conscious playfulness. It, I mean, someone who actually say um, I'm, that I'm a vulgar person, um, no. <laughs> Bao, Bao Yu can say that, right? But, but when Bao Yu said that, 我是熟中又熟的一个熟人罢了, he doesn't mean it, right? Or rather, it is his way of, um, as I said, it's his version of oppositional aesthetics that, that he is setting up different rules and so on. Um, but you're absolutely right that um, a lot of it is about discursive authority, a lot of it about very specialized knowledge. And I have to say very often, I feel that I'm not even qualified to judge whether they are right to to think what they think because they're talking about things I don't know a lot of the times. Sometimes they, they repeat uh, misinformation that that's I guess that's when I can confidently say that they're also copying from each other and <laughs> maybe not um, you know not um, not specifically um, creating their own brand of knowledge. This is something that um, Clunas pointed out quite perceptively that, that the degree of copying, and, and it's not just the main authors copying from each other. What I found is that they copy a lot from song, song writings as well. Um, and um, which is, if, if you would, which is, um, a little bit unexpected because some some of these writings is really about uh, offering a, a very idiosyncratic version of what is tasteful and 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 yet at the same time they also repeat each other's uh, information sometimes. Okay, okay uh, Liang Luo, uh, thank you, Professor Li, for this extremely enjoyable talk. I have more of a, of a comment than a question. I'm reminded of the case of Gong Linna, one of the most experimental musicians in contemporary China, who is often perceived as vulgar at first sight, but whose experiments are quite elegant in terms of her use of a wide range of highly cultivated musical traditions. 
This may be related to daya ji da su or da su ji da ya. Maybe the key is to define what accounts as da so as to transcend the boundaries. And apologies again for my tones. Right, right, right. No, no, absolutely. Um, so there, there is always that, of course, right? Um, that's why you have all these ugly people, deformed people in drunks, right? And the, there's that passage when he said, where's the Tao? And he said, it's, like, it's in the tiles. And then, and then he said, it's in the low yi, it's in the ends, and then it's in um, excrement and so on. So right. it's when your mind is capacious enough to encompass it, encompass opposites and, and to, um, then of course, then you can say that that is da ya. Then it's big enough that you 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 can rise above all these um, distinctions, right? I think that the desire for that is always there. Then then we are leaving behind um, the the realm of taste, and then it becomes philosophical transcendence, right? That's true. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Hui Jun Mai. Thank you, Professor Li, uh, for the intriguing study. I wonder about the efficacy of the object of beauty itself in the matter of judgment of taste. What I have in mind presently is the rhapsodies on goddesses. There, the object of beauty almost overwhelms the beholder, Song Yu and Sao Zhu, for example, and compels him to reproduce her beauty in language. Whereas what we see in Miao Yu and other cases discussed today is that beauty and elegance is entirely in the discretion of the beholder. So hello, Hui Jun. Hui Jun um, <laughs> was in our program. Okay. <laughs> can see your face, but it's nice to know that you're there. Um, <laughs> um, so Hui Jun, I, I'm not absolutely sure what you mean. Let me, let me look at um, the look question at the, again. Yeah. yeah. The efficacy of the objects of beauty in matter of judgment. Efficacy in the sense of whether the object itself has a way to um, work on the beholder, you mean? There's going to be right. a resounding silence. The efficacy of the object. I mean, of course, the object in, in the case of the goddess poems is because the, the object is a, a person, right? But when, when, it's, when, the, when the thing itself is just a thing, then what happens? Then how, how can we talk about the efficacy? Then it has to be only in relation to us, the beholder. How can the thing in itself has agency? That's not what I'm, what I'm not clear about. Well, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have Maybe. to think about that one. Question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What What were you saying, Alison? No, I was just thinking that perhaps uh, Hui Jun could could uh, type in a little bit of extra clarification there a bit in a while. But maybe we'll move on now to Paula Versado. Um, in light of Hong Man's extremely refined structure, its self reflexivity as a work of art, and its shifting boundaries vis-à-vis -vis the real world of the reader. Is there any sense that the book's discourse of Yasu is also being applied to itself? So Paula is a dear friend. So hi, Paula. It's so strange <laughs> to see you just, just in space without seeing your face. Um, so what are we talking about? Oh, um, uh, 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 let me, did, did Paula type it out? OK. Yes, uh, it's typed, yeah. yeah. I, of course, yeah, I, I, that absolutely is true that um, uh, I think it's, it's, it, it is very self-consciously thinking about how it is being perceived as, um, as um, Yao Su, right? You have that very much in chapter one when uh, um, in the beginning when this, you have this very self-reflexive beginning on what exactly are you reading? Is this something that you want to read after you have had your dinner and just want a moment of relaxation or is it some deep profound rumination on the meaning of existence and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, all these comparison with um, 
with all the um, Cai Zi Jia Ren fiction before and after that, that is in chapter one and also later when Jia Mu talks about it in chapter, I forgot what, 50 something. So there, there are a lot of this kind of, um, there's a, a, a great self-awareness of how he is being read, but I wonder whether he thinks in terms of Yasu like that, but certainly is um, how this is, how this will be read, how this will be evaluated, that the fact that he's using the vernacular medium, um, the fact that he is so steeped in literary traditions that he's totally in control of the discourse and um, he's aware of all that and also anticipating how the book will be read. Absolutely, I think that's true. Uh, another question from Calvin Lim, um, which is another question that might be slightly unrelated. Is there a way to measure or observe to what extent did the introduction of Western culture in the mid to late Qing era change the conversations on vulgar and elegant, or did these two matters have relatively little correlation? You know, there I am. Um, I must plead ignorance because I just don't know enough about um, the discourses on the subject in um, in the late Qing. Um, but think of it this way: like if Huang Junxian talks about electricity in his poem, then is is this elegant or vulgar? It's almost irrelevant, right? That if you, you let's say if you break the quorum by introducing subjects that is not normally covered in um, in poetry, but now you put it in and you in some ways break rules and so on, but you, because it's something so new, then it's like mapping a different set of um, values on, on um, established categories of judgment. So maybe there, there's not necessarily a meeting place there. If you think about all the translated literature, do they talk about it as Yao or Su? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, if anything, they are kind of all enamored of the idea that, at least with fiction, that, that this is a medium that can change the populace and so on. So that becomes a rallying cry, something very meaningful and important to achieve rather than to avoid, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Goes back to Tong Fu. Yeah. Okay, a couple more. Uh, Ji Wei Xiao, oh, uh, returning to the question before, what I mean is that Jinping Mei is very much about senses. When talking about senses, was regarded as vulgar at the time. Is that true? I don't think so, because um, because that's what we live by. So how how can then how can senses itself be vulgar? It's how you talk about the senses, right? Um, and Jimmy May is, is very strange in that way because there's a lot of, um, there, there is quite a bit of um, pleasures, the, the pleasure of the senses, but it doesn't often doesn't go beyond that to talk about the way we usually give meaning to things like sentimental um, value or, or um, emotions of various kinds, uh, moral meanings, political meanings, whatever, that that it, it doesn't go, go from the sensual description to other types of meanings. That's where it's truly peculiar. There's, there are very few works like that, especially because the whole tradition is built on um, like all this Qing Jing Zhao Rong and Xin Wu Zhao Rong is about how you can commune with things, give them meaning and so on and so forth. At least in poetry, that's how it works. But Xin Ping Mei is so resistant to that types of meanings, right? Um, but I, I would say that the senses themselves cannot, cannot be vulgar because, um, you know, so you can say, Yang Liu Yi Yi or Yu Shi Fei Fei is also about the senses. It, it, it is a phrase that conveys to you how the snow feels or how the willows feels, right? So it 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 can't. I mean, that's the basic that's the basic thing. Um, maybe more to the point is to, to, whether um, whether one has to go beyond the explicitly physical in order to enter 
a, a more ethereal refined sphere now that's that's another matter and indeed the discourse this the, the, there's a lot of discussion of that um as as Alison said earlier and it's a bit of um perpetual shift because sometimes it's really by um um em embracing the, the kind of the lowly um senses or, or describing very mundane senses that that you can introduce newness into into the discourse where right? you think about some song poetry trying to do that um or some even some meeting poets trying to do that too but per sensory perception itself can cannot by definition be be dismissed as as vulgar i don't think good to know <laughs> Okay, a couple more. Uh, you team, Bill, Oops, are we dying out? Okay. Hello, you still there? Yeah. Uh, you team, Leo. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee, for your beautiful talk, fascinating talk. I'm interested in the vulgarity and elegance of the body in both novels. For example, the animal-like body of Granny Leo and Dayu's disease. Um, I'm curious about how you think of the relationship between the idea of elegance and vulgarity and the aesthetics of the body. So the aesthetics of the body is a, is um, also, you know, I don't know whether I'm qualified to speak about this because there's a whole literature out there on on bodies, you know, dead bodies, life bodies, and so on. But I would just say that um, at least as far as the aesthetics, if we're talking about Holomon, then then then. There's certainly a gradation of how concretely a body is described, right? Uh, yeah. So, I'm, I'm, as I'm sure you know, so when Lin Yu is um, introduced to you um, in chapter three, um, the, the description is kind of evasive and and and. Um, and deliberately non-specific, right? Um, it, it talks about her eyebrows. Um, um, right? That that um, that her, her eyebrows seem to be frowning, but not, and it's wreathed in mist. And um, uh, that her eye seems to be smiling, yet not smiling, and they are full of feelings and so on. So it's 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 it's, it's a it's a it's a phrase that affirm and negates in in all the in all the all the phrases used to describe her. She is like this, but maybe she is not like that, as if this way, but not quite that way. And the last line is "bio yi zhong feng liu tai du," that that she has a certain grace about her. And uh, as I always tell my students, you never know what she is wearing except in chapter 49 when she has that red cape on because everybody else has a red cape as well and it's snowing outside so it makes for a good contrast. It's what Gaolian <laughs> said about red clothes in the snow. Yeah. Um, and so, so you can say that the body is, at least in the first 80 chapters, at least Linda Yu's body is not very concrete. Um, that is why the last 40 chapters to me feels very different because you have some very detailed description of her clothing. <coughs> At one point she is um, uh, wearing um, um, yang face the xiu hua qun, so some sort of pink embroidered skirt. And um, when she coughs her, her phlegm, the blood, the way the blood moves in it, like as if the blood is jumping or something I su su the luan tiao like the, the, the trace of blood in it seems to be trembling in a very concrete way. Mm -hmm. So whereas when she's sick before, like when Jia Bao you sends her the handkerchiefs and she looks at it, she understands what it means, she writes poems on it, she goes to look at the mirror and um and then she has the um she she's actually quite flushed and it, it what she doesn't know is that it's the beginning of consumption. But the way it's described is um, Lian Fan Taohua, that she has the, she's flushing like a peach blossom. And um, but what you do not know is that actually this is the beginning of illness. So this is, if you think about a sick body, this is about as, 
as if you would, as elegant, as refined, as ethereal as, as it can be. Compare that to her death when 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 it becomes very concrete, the the even what she spits out, the traces of blood, how it is moving and so on. And so it's it's just a different writer. I mean, it's a different. It, it, someone wrote wrote a diff, Someone else wrote that part of the novel, and that's that's the way it is. We don't have to say that it is. It's terrible. It's not that. It's just a different sensibility when it comes to the concreteness of the body. Mm. So, in in um, so if you think about Jin Ping Mei, then then it it actually has a lot of stock description on the shape of the eyes and and and. It, and um, of course, all, all kinds of uh, sexual details as well. Actually, Hong Moon doesn't have a, um, a, a lot of it. Um, he, he, never mind Lin Dai Yu, even the other characters, um, Wang Xifeng, there's quite a bit uh, of what she's wearing and so on. But actually, it has less than Jin Ping Mei in terms of the, 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 the sheer number of um, occurrences of describing what a person is wearing and the shape of their features and so on. There's much less that kind of description. So I don't know to what extent this enters into the discussion of elegance and vulgarity, but it's not the aesthetics of that author, that's all. Um, when, when it comes to capturing what a person is about. Thank you. One more question and then <laughs> I think we, we should let you rest. Um, Peng Liu, hello, Professor Lee or Liu Peng. Thank you for your talk. I wonder how intended readers affected the construction of the realms of Yang Fu in the novels you mentioned. So it's not just in the novel, you know, that's an excellent question. I, I would say that um, the readership is very much um, it is it, very much part of the um, um, I don't know I want to say calculation but it's not a calculation but the imagined reader is is really important in a lot of these writings because when you are talking about a regime of taste no matter how natural you are you you really always imagine a kind of spectator because it's such a social construct ultimately, right? And, it, and it, it is about putting yourself in comparison to other people. So um, Jin Ping Mei is a bit of a mystery because we still don't know who wrote it and because it's, it's so revolutionary, so unlike anything before it. Um, so what, what would be the reader? We know that um, what record we have of early readers like Yuan Hongdao, they really think that it's like Yang Xiong is, is the most amazing literature and so on. Because for them, this must be, this must be such a revelation, right? To, to, to have this world in front of their eyes. But you, you have, in other words, you have the reader's response, very few granted, but you have you know, at least uh, six or seven from, from, from the, late 17th century, late 16th century, early 17th century, but it's, are those the readers that the, the um, author intends? That, 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 is, that is really hard to know because I, so what, what is the level of literacy? And if, if his literate reader, would, would he prefer to read a Fengmeng Long Hua Ben story rather than Jin Ping Mei, which is a very difficult book to read after all, right? In, in terms of its length and complexity and so on. But if it is, um, a, a literati reader that this author has in mind, then it, this, it, this is describing a world that is the opposite of, of his world. I mean, it has some of the material um, paraphernalia of it, the, you know, the, the, uh, of an affluent household, but otherwise the sensibility being so different from it, then why? That is why I, I, I began, and it's not a question to actually have an answer. That, that's why I thought maybe ultimately it is also a statement against all those conventional constructs of what elegance can, elegance can promise. Or maybe, for example, is, is the promise justification of a connection to ethics or um, is promise of something that is self-contained or, or um, elevated or something, it, it, it's just as if it's making a statement against those things. So how would it appeal to a literati reader? I, it's just hard for me to imagine. 
Hormone is very different because it, 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 we know that it circulated for, um, um, for 30 years among a group of his um, family and friends, right? So in some ways he's writing to a group that knows that world and maybe in some ways share his sensibility or share his memories or something. Uh, yeah, and that, you know, and, and, and also feeling that maybe he will be misread or misunderstood, that's all these, um, what everybody else comments on, all these metafictional things at the beginning, maybe, um, maybe a way to anticipate that about how he will be read or misread as well. Thank you. Uh, so, I think we, we, I think that we should wrap up and let you rest. Thank you very much. That was. Uh, should, should I share the really screen? And well, actually, you don't need to because um, I don't need to. Okay. So, yeah, Sophie and Connie have both uh, put uh, details in the chat box of uh, uh, thanking everybody for submitting questions. And if you have any more questions, please contact uh, you um, at your email. Um, and that uh, was a reminder that we would love to hear from hear about your feedback about this session and suggestions. If you could do a fill out a survey, and registration for Friday's research seminar can be done through this link. And there are the YouTube recording of this lecture will be um, available um, and eventually, and you can look at, go to the link that's given here. Um, so I think um, it's been wonderful. Um, we still have 76 people listening in. Um, we had about 200 uh, at least at, uh, um, at the beginning and continued all the way through. Um, it's been, I've, I've learned so much and it's been fascinating. And I look forward to Friday's seminar um, on Thank you. objectifying people and humanizing things in Chinese culture. See you all on Friday. Thank you very much, Wei. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for their questions and please forgive me if I did not answer them adequately. Thank you. I think more than adequately. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you everybody for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.